right, welcome to today's episode of Tomorrow's Leader, where we dive deep on all things leader related, related to leading yourself, leading others, making an impact on the people around you. And who better than the guests that we have on today? I'm super excited for this because I've gotten a chance to know her and follow her and see her rise to stardom over the last 13 years. Carolyn Nolan, who is an incredibly successful, impactful financial advisor based in Winchester, Massachusetts, who I got a chance to know in 2007, 13 years ago when she was uh, only a handful of years in the business. And uh, you're going to hear in a few moments about all the great success she's had. So Carolyn, welcome to the show. Hi, John. <laughs> Good to have you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. So so many things to talk about and ask you about. Um, you know, I'd love to just maybe start with a little bit. So for the audience, get to know you, the people that don't get, don't know you, uh, maybe a little just about your background, kind of what got you into what you're doing right now. Um, and then we'll, we'll talk about what you're doing now. Sure. So I started in the business in 2004, right out of college where I studied psychology and Italian. So of course I became a financial advisor. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, I have no background in it. I literally randomly fell into it. And it was a, a friend's husband who happened to be in the office when I was interviewing. And he was like, Carolyn, what are you doing here? I didn't even know you're looking at this. I'm like, I don't know either, but I have to interview. I have to get a job. And he, he literally, Peter Dish, he locked me in his office and he convinced me, you have to try this thing. Like, you'll you'll learn everything you need to learn about being a financial advisor but if i don't convince you to give this a try your life may never like be what it could be like you need to try this and i was like ah that's good enough reason for me that sounds good so that's how i started <laughs> and so it wasn't anything that you really had any vision of when you were in school or anything like that it literally it almost came to you so to speak yeah, and I'm one of those people that like really believes in paying attention to the universe. Like, don't misunderstand me as this fluffy, but it's not like really, that's the kind of stuff I try to pay attention to because I do think we get different signs and you just got to be open to saying like, yeah, what the hell? And that's what I did. And um, it's the hardest, but most awesome, exhilarating, challenging personally fulfilling, financially fulfilling, most amazing ride I've been on. And right now we're talking at a point in the business that I feel like I'm actually really enjoying the journey. And there isn't like this place I'm trying to get to, but I'm genuinely just continuing to transform personally, professionally, and every person in my team and in my practice that I touch. And I didn't understand that's what I was signing up for. And that's not what every advisor signs up for. But that was kind of the feeling, I think, of like that I got when Peter was like, give it a try of like, and Larry Post then being like, you know, if you have the heart of a social worker and the, and the mind of a capitalist and I'm like, yeah, yeah, sign me up for that. That sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's how it started. Yeah. But I didn't know anything about financial anythings. Yeah. But you learned, you learned fast. I learned. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Let me ask you a question real quick. You, you brought up um, a great point that you're enjoying the journey now, because I think a lot of people, a lot of leaders, a lot of just people in business and in and, and life uh, are so focused on the destination. And you, at what point, two questions, I guess, what point did you start to really enjoy the journey? Um, and what, what kind of, what's that all about? How important is that, do you think? Um, I mean, I think it's everything. I think, I think the, it was only a couple of years ago that I really started to understand it. And I'm going to completely credit it to strate the strategic coach program um, that one of my colleagues in Ameriprise introduced me to a long time ago. And three years ago, I engaged coach and they're all about, they're basically like therapists for entrepreneurs. So I joined this 10 X group and it's all entrepreneurs all over the world who were producing or netting, I think at least $500,000 a year. That was like, they made you send like a tax return because you're at a different points in your business. You have different concerns, issues, et cetera. So I already had like a business. Then I was, I was at a point that it was like, not about being like successful. It's about like understanding like what's my purpose, like in the world and like what's like fulfilling for me. So being around all those kind of folks, like really got me jazzed up and they literally teach you and train you and give you tools on how to literally just slow down. 
Like I don't slow my roll in terms of like my like millions of ideas that come to me at all times every day. But it was less of it, this like anxiety feeling of like, I'm not where I'm supposed to be. It was like, no, I'm exactly where I, I should be right now. And I'm really excited for the next thing, but I'm going to enjoy this like J curve part of the journey, which sometimes is really clunky. Um, and just learning to be like more present, including if things suck, it's just being able to unapologetically be like, it sucks, but it's not going to suck forever. Like this sucks right now. And I found that helped me actually be a way better leader too, to not be like, I think before sometimes people misunderstand my positivity as like, oh, are you just, everything's great all the time. And I'm like, no, but I'm aware enough to know that if I only talk about negative things, even when things are negative, I'm only going to be in a negative headspace, which isn't going to help me get out of it. Mm -hmm. So it's just helped me to be more aware um, and to find the words and the way to say things that makes it more tangible for others to like be part of that conversation and just to be unapologetically be but get to that next place yeah so it sounds like that you know you 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 can get so anxious and so much anxiety from focusing on where you're trying to get to versus you become really present you're enjoying the journey and you're also you mentioned leadership it helps you become a better leader uh, do you find that is that something that you consciously now do is try to help people do the same thing or and, yeah yeah mm -hmm. so when i did um like, you know, you, you state like your, your, your Doug Lenick thing to perform cards and you do your values cards. And my whole team, by the way, it's one of the it's part of an interview process is everyone like we have a big tracker of everyone's personal values or Colby, blah, blah, blah. But I've always like when I've done that filter of like, what are my values? Leadership was always, I couldn't get it to five. I think it's like eight, uh, integrity, autonomy, um, Excellence excellence uh you know i of course i can't think of it because i'm talking about it out loud but anyway because <laughs> you showed and shared that with me yeah there you go see so that so but leadership was always one of them and i um at a different point in our career and well not in the career i'd say in the, early on in the business when i was just trying to figure out like what the heck we even do like and i tried doing coaching for like supporting other uh, advisors and i hated it like i hated it i hated it i hated Why'd it, you hate it? I think I hated it because I didn't get to pick who I was coaching. Mm. Like it was like you were assigned to like a meeting. And then like, and even like I'd have sometimes other women, especially in the business that would like come in my office, sometimes close the door and be like, can I ask you for advice? And I'm like, you can, but I have a rule. If you ask me for advice and I give you advice and you don't actually take it, never ask me for advice again. <laughs> I'm like, we can get cocktails, we can be friends, but don't ask me for advice. Cause I only want to, and I do that in my practice too. I only work with people that one, I want to hug. Like I'm at a place now, I only work with people I genuinely love, care about, at least care about them as a person. You know, maybe love is too strong of a word or it's going to be misunderstood, but like really genuine care for those people. Same thing in my team. But if they're not willing to do what we say we got to do, I just can't be part of it. Yeah. Not we, again, not we can't be friends, but we can't be in practice together. And in leadership, it over the years, I found as I was, personally like doing a lot of like you know buying properties having kids like balancing it all um and i knew i was doing a pretty good job at it just like and and it wasn't always just like we everything's great and markets are great and life is great like there's like you know family like div like divorce of my parents and like 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 never mind just a divorce but really messy things and losing properties and and miscarrying a baby like you know, halfway plus through like, you know, like just crazy shit that happens. But I was just like, no, I just got to keep moving forward because I got to still be a leader for people. And part of my leadership also was like, it helped me to get through, but just be like, how to be a positive example for people um, in really crappy times. Because like, all of us can just like sit around and complain about stuff, but that's not going to get us anywhere. I'm like, all right, you're allowed to vent but then you have to look at where can I be productive and get to next stuff. And you have to do that in every part of your life. Mm -hmm. So I think the thing for me is I think, I think once I was able to really understand how it's not like I studied it, I was just paying attention to what was working when I was able to just be myself, I kept getting exponentially more successful faster. So mm -hmm. even like a silly little thing, like when I stopped wearing suits, I had clients that literally were like, you look so much more comfortable. 
I was like, oh. And then like I opened up my own office on the independent side and I have it, you know, I just gave you the, like the face like, FaceTime tour and it's like girly, but not pink. And it's just me. Like people walk in and they're like, oh, this is Carolyn's face. I can tell. But people just feel comfortable and I'm not doing it to like sell someone. I like, frankly, I do it because I like it. Yeah. And there's no like, Carolyn, the financial advisor, Carolyn, the person. And I think the more that you instill those habits in every part of your life, it just becomes just that it's a habit, including being positive, optimistic, trying to be a leader. Like I'm trying to be a leader for myself before anyone else even. Yeah. Well, I think leaders forget that too. You've got to lead yourself first. And to your point, you're going through really tough times. So you felt like your role as a leader and influencer to other people helped you because you felt, was it because you felt the need to be stronger or show more strength? Or was it because you needed to feel like you led yourself through it so that you can lead other people through stuff, tough stuff? Um, Well, I actually don't think it's about being so strong. I think it's about just being honest, including like when things stink and when you're really sad or like realizing you need help. I think that's such a strength. So even part of the coach thing is all about focus, strategic coach is all about focusing on what are you really good at? So not just what are you good at, like in terms of technical skills, like it's funny because actually one of our clients right now reached out to me that she was thinking about maybe joining our team. And she's like, we're, we're like a couple conversations into it. And, and she's like, oh my God, Carolyn, I realized I never sent you my resume. Like, is that so awful? And then she goes, but you know what? I was talking to my other friend, reminds me a lot of you. And she goes, you know, I realized, and he was saying too, Carolyn hires people. She doesn't hire resumes. It's not about skills. So people that really know themselves is like, that's the most attractive people to be around in business and life and everything. Cause you can figure stuff out. Whereas people that are not self-aware, um, or feel they have to pretend they are someone they're not, or feel like they just focus on their weaknesses. Like I just have now created a team of people that are really good at stuff that I suck at. <laughs> <laughs> and and inspiring them to like you don't have to be good at everything like like for us to just get clear on like what actually matters and for you personally to like get to your next level like let's focus on things that give you energy and that you get excited about that you could do 20 I mean John I could like talk 24 7 like you know that like I love that <laughs> but others like it would pain them and they'd have to prepare stuff and I'm like oh my god don't put that person in that situation then right. only put people in a spot that they're going to thrive maybe not day one, day two, but ultimately they're going to be in a place that's like, yeah, that's where I should be. So I seek to like help people understand first, like my clients, my friends, my colleagues, definitely my team, definitely my family. Let's like try to understand like, what is just innately you? Like, how are you just hardwired to like, just be? And because I think the sooner we learn that, that's also where we get just like this peaceful happiness. Yeah. Instead of this anxiety, I'm not what everyone says I'm supposed to be. I'm like, who even made that up? Like, that's so stupid. Yeah, you're living <laughs> life for somebody else or for other people. So, yeah. and that's refreshing because I think a lot of people get focused on, hey, I got I to gotta focus on my weaknesses in order to develop and become ultimately the best version of myself. And your philosophy is, is the opposite. It's go with your strengths, make them stronger, spend your time doing what you're really good at. Is that right? Yep, 100%. Yeah. So t- take me through a little bit. Your your story of success is incredible. I mean, you know, to share a little bit with the audience, when I knew you in 2007, eight, nine time frame, you were doing, let's say, a couple hundred thousand in business. Um, now, fast forward 11 or so years later, you're doing 10 times that. You're 2 million in business. That is phenomenal growth in a tough business, in a tough industry, and during some really tough times, if you think about that. You had, you know, you had 2008 when you were starting, you have now, you have everything in between. Was, when did things really start cranking? And what, tell, talk to us a little bit about that, because you obviously figured things out at some point and put it in overdrive and got this explosive growth. Yeah, so, I mean, when I went from the, P1, the, the uh, employee advisor side to the franchise side of the firm. And like, I love the firm. So that was never a distraction. But for me, like I needed to have, I needed to be able to make independent decisions. So, and this is for me, I don't believe the independent platform is like where everyone's going to thrive, but it became so obvious 
as soon as I came over, including that I came into this big space that was totally empty. And one of my unique abilities is like, like creating beautiful things. Like that's just something I love to do. Mm -hmm. And with our clients, it creates an experience with our team. It creates an experience, but that was like the first move that literally opened up my brain and my mind and my creativity to like, I could do anything and I can work with anyone and I can hire someone because I feel like it, which sometimes just because you can doesn't mean you should. And I've learned that too. <laughs> so it hasn't just been smooth sailing the whole way or like, you know, just because I can build out an office and build a cape house and be pregnant at the same time and all these other things doesn't mean that's a good idea. But that was a good learning <laughs> of like, learn like when it's probably like, don't totally overfill your bucket. Maybe it's did a you, little bit. Did you do that? Did you feel like you put, you had too much going on at one time? Uh, yeah. I mean, no shit, John. Like all joking aside, like I'm not faulting myself in the literal sense, but I believe the stress of it all caused for me to miscarry at 19 weeks with what would have been my third and I now thank God have three and I can't imagine my life without my little Marty but that was the shittiest most terrible thing I don't wish on my worst enemy mm. to go through but I have you know and now there's this COVID thing and all the stuff that like two degrees out of our control so one of my learnings to myself I, I don't fault myself with that happening but I promised myself that I will never let that happen again in terms of I'm going to take intentional stress and pressures, but I'm not going to let it get to a point or even more so I'm not going to be too stubborn to ask for help. And I'm going to look to delegate as much as humanly possible. So still at that time and me and my, my husband, Tim, we have like, uh, I think 10, 12, I don't know. We have a lot of properties. <laughs> And we keep getting more, which is why I'm like, I don't know. That's like part something that we do on the side, you know, in our free time. But we used to do 100% of everything by ourselves, including like paying all the bills. And paying a bill for a house sounds like no big deal. But then you have like tenants, people have questions, things randomly break. When pipes freeze, they freeze in all four houses at the same time. And usually the stock market crashes, like when you're on a vacation and your kids are screaming. So the bottom line is I had to go, I can't do it all myself. But you know what was even better than saying I can't? It's saying I don't want to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because as soon as I started to understand that unique ability thing, and it wasn't in the beginning, which is why I think I was able to get myself in a position that I took on more than was really humanly possible. And frankly, it was stupid because I was doing a ton of stuff out of my unique ability. So it was that compound effect. Like if you do one thing that's out of your space, like it's not just, it's the opposite. Well, a unique ability is I could do it 24 seven, every day, all day, and I get more energy from doing it. And the polar opposite are things that literally you're doing activity for like 10 minutes and it drains your bucket for the week of energy. And I was doing a lot of that stuff. Yeah. So I think just learning that <laughs> was like, ding, ding, ding. Like you gotta, who, like, again, I'm gonna just take all the strategic coach stuff because I'm so impressed with just how simple it is. And like Dan Sullivan, the owner of coach says, you gotta who up. So it's about finding the who, not the how. Mm -hmm. So if you're not sure how to do something or you're not the person who should be the one figuring out how, you gotta find a who. Sometimes my who is Instacart. I don't wanna go to the flipping grocery store. <laughs> and usually I think of this stuff at 11 o'clock at night. So I've been doing Instacart for like four years. Or like find other who's aren't always people, it's different technology. So I just found that I quickly became really good at identifying not just, oh, let me delegate this email to this person, but in my whole life, wherever I could delegate, simplify, or even more so, it's not delegate, it's like Della up. Like, let me give it to someone who's going to do a way better job mm -hmm. with this than I am. And that became way more fun. And again, I wasn't try doing it to be a leader for others. I was doing it actually to selfishly help myself, but I found it allowed me to be a leader to others. Yeah. And you, you're giving up control. A lot of leaders get, you know, they hit that ceiling of complexity because they yeah. give up control. They feel like, okay, I got to get my hands in everything. So yeah. that sounds like a big turning point uh, for you. So letting go and, and what, how, um, so a couple questions. One is you talk about unique ability. Uh, that's something I know a lot of people struggle to figure out. It took me years to figure out and understand what my unique ability was. Some people have not figured it out, but have heard that concept. What advice do you give to somebody who doesn't necessarily know what their unique ability, maybe it's not, you know, jumping out at them and, oh, well, this is obvious. How do they figure it out? 
So the process that I went through with coach, it's literally first ask a bunch of people who you know and trust or who know you and that you trust will tell you the truth. It, it, should, it should be people that are above you, under you, leaders, family, friends, the people that know you and just ask them, how would you describe me? Like, what, what do you think, what do you think my, not, maybe you don't say unique ability because I think that's confusing and it gets confusing as people tie it back to like, what's my skill or what's my, what should be my job? And like, even it's funny, I was on a plan, on a call with a client this morning and we were talking about financial planning and I was like, I think our industry is all screwed up because honestly, it's not planning, it's preparing. We're in the financial preparing business. So unique ability, I think is also a term that's tricky because it's not actually like, this defined thing it's more of like what are the types of things that and it may be something very specific for me it isn't like my unique ability is not being a financial advisor my unique ability is like inspiring confidence and getting people excited and um also organ being pre literally prepared for anything not just financial but like i've got like starter lists for everything in life and it's not because i'm afraid but it's because i have a million ideas that come at me all the time and I started just like organizing them. So then when it's all of a sudden, like someone comes up with, you know, how would we approach blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, I started this brainstorm like five years ago here, start here, maybe so you don't have to start with nothing. <laughs> and like, that's the kind of stuff I do. Um, but I had a whole list of a bunch of different stuff. And what was really exciting about doing that exercise, and it was wicked hard. Like I paid someone to help me do it. And I was still trying to tell this woman, Julia, as I'm going through the exercise with her, cause she's like, all these people kept saying this thing about you. That's unique ability, Carolyn. And I'm like, no, that's not, that's stupid. That's not unique ability. I just like do that thing. And she's like doing that thing is unique ability when it's not something everybody does. And I'm like, oh, um, interesting. But what I found was once I was able to define what it is, it again became even more clear when I was in a space that's not my unique ability. <laughs> So it was like, all right, this is important. And it doesn't mean I'm entitled to tomorrow. Someone else needs to do it for me. Um, but it became, it helped me to then create more like exciting, tangible. And I don't even think goal is the right word, but it's more of this vision of what does our next look like? Mm -hmm. And it's more about being impactful for like the whole world and being a leader for like, I seek to be a leader for all financial advisors, mm -hmm. for all professionals in our like, like extended field, like, you know, seeking to be excellent, awesome, approachable, knowledgeable. Um, I wish for every, like, I don't see competition. Like I want more people to act in the way that our team does. And I want to collaborate with people that have other things because mm -hmm. there's so, everyone needs our help. Mm -hmm. So that's where I start to think about how can we literally change the world by sharing this stuff and getting people to become more self-aware and not just in like tell people focus on things you stink at but that's how we grow up which a totally other topic for another day i think it's so screwed up yeah. <laughs> we're brought up in like you need to be tutored on this because you suck at it and this and this and this and i'm like this is not the real world this is not how the world works it's not and it's so funny <laughs> i feel the same way it's just counter it's the exact opposite of really how you achieve really? big success and happiness too yeah. wants to be yeah. spending their time doing things they suck at <laughs> yeah yeah uh, so I, I want to shift gears a little bit. One of the things that I loved, I got a chance, and and by the way, you, you know, we we went through your office right before this for the for the uh, audience that's listening, and it is beautiful, um, absolutely gorgeous, and it it's uh, it speaks a lot. You can almost look at your office and and see your culture. If I knew nothing about your organization, you can kind of get a sense that there's uh it speaks to everything from your personality it's fun it's professional it's organized it's inviting there's a lot to it right it's different and then i saw your manifesto where or you do talk about your i guess it's your handbook that you um have for your business and that speaks to you that's like you all over it and it's your culture of your organization Tell us about what is, what is culture to you? Why is it important? And I'd love to share a little bit about some of the specifics with yours. Yeah. Well, I mean, culture is like everything. So, <laughs> I mean, I, even on the, um, and it's, it's not, and let me be really clear. I'm not saying, um, so when I left the, the employee advisor side, I didn't leave. I was going to a culture. I didn't leave something. I was going towards something that I could build. And 
I think what became more challenging for me when I had kids, especially was like our industry, let's be clear. Our industry is not Everyone says they're all inviting to women, blah, blah, blah. The culture does not feel like that at all. It's like an afterthought, like, oh, right, you had a baby. Um, so what are we going to do with you now? <laughs> and it's like, it's actually, it's like, it, again, it's an afterthought. So I wanted to create a culture and a space that, not even create, but like more like, a, like it already exists. I wanted to expand on it. That, especially for women, was like a safe space to just be, especially moms who sometimes get calls and yes, it's usually mom. And yes, I get it. Sometimes it's only dad, but oftentimes it's mom gets the call or is expected to be at a meeting. Um, and that's very hard for like a lot of women in all different industries to still like, they sometimes get to fight for it. And I believe that for, I don't believe this is entitlement, but I believe for the right players, this culture will enable them to kind of like have your cake and eat it too in terms of like building a successful business and professional space for yourself but also just to be mom or to like have a bad day and vent about something and i believe that women too moms especially like you can't teach someone like how to be motherly like i don't know it's just something happens when you have that little person you're like ah like everyone says it, you know, your life will never be the same. Um, and I found that most of us are moms in our office. Some of them are, some, some, actually there's some guys we've invited in. We've let some of you in. Um, but they have, they understand what they're coming into, that this is a family. So I guess that's how I can describe my culture. First of all, we're colleagues, but we're family. Um, we openly say what we think like family. Sometimes we disagree. It doesn't mean everyone has a vote, but everyone has a say and I want to hear it. Because it's actually really important to me that everyone that's part of my team feels that they're part of not just this team, but literally the feeling is family and respect and fun and growing and exciting. And we treat our clients like that, but it starts with your team directly, not with your client. And how, so how much do you have to, what happens when that you feel like the culture, if you do, those times where you feel like it's kind of, hey, we're getting off track or it's going a different direction. How do, what do you do? And as a leader, what, what do you recommend a leader to do? Well, so we've, that's like part of where we even created the manifesto, the handbook, because we wanted to capture as much as we could that was like in our heads to words. And I actually had my team collaborate to create it. So it's not even from me. So I found the less that was from me, but I set the tone of what I wanted they figured out how to do it, it became ours. So it's not me demanding anything, but it's kind of like, this is what I'm looking to create, are you in or are you out? And for us to find an open like space that it's safe to say like, and for people to understand like, um, you know, I'm also not perfect. Like I'm, I'm supposed to be the boss. I hate the freaking word boss. I'm the leader. You know, you know what I like to say is I'm like Tom Brady. Well, I guess I shouldn't say Tom Brady anymore, but I don't know football. So that's all I know. So I'm like Tom Brady. Like I'm the, uh, you know, I'm the person in charge here. I'm making the plays, but I'm on the freaking field with you. So you better back me up when I make that call <laughs> and let's talk about it off the field. <laughs> We're on the field. We're on the field. So our team, we have like, we started not just to have a meeting to have a meeting, but we have like very specific regular times that we are as a group getting together monthly, um, whether it's in person, ideally on like link WebEx for others, if they're already not working, everyone's on WebEx now, or um, quarterly, we get together offsite and we don't talk about anything that's real time, but we're brainstorming together and everyone's collaborating together. And then we do fun stuff. So like really like, you know, that's the four times a year we definitely do get together because most of us do have kids. So the thought of like getting a drink after work, it's kind of like, no offense, I want to go home and see my family. And it's like, yeah, no offense taken, go home. <laughs> but we also have wine in the office so we can like have wine before we go home. So we do that too. <laughs> Important. Well, you know, and that's good. You've got a great balance. I mean, I think a lot of leaders feel like, okay, it's got to all be business, business, business. And you know, it's, that becomes very boring and mundane and people want to be able to have fun and and uh and enjoy the people that they're working with yeah well and that's where in terms of the how like i use a lot of the strategic coach tools that like literally spoon feed you it's again it's think of it the best way i can summarize it it's like therapy for entrepreneurs like good therapists ask great questions like they don't tell you what to do or how to think 
but they ask you a lot of open-ended questions that take you through this filter that by the end you're like, oh my God, like you have the answers in your head of what you should do, but you just can't see it clearly. So I've used those tools as thinking tools. And I oftentimes will literally do them with my team together, not just me by myself, because my team more than ever too, I'm the they can support me and my vision the more that they understand how I think. And that's what I tell our clients as well. So there isn't this separation with how I talk to my team, how I talk to our clients, how I talk to my friends, how I talk to me, how me and you just like shoot the shit. Like I say the same exact stuff to yeah. everybody. So I also find it's less exhausting when you don't have to wear this like hat. <laughs> right, right. Just this, is financial advisor. this is me at home. I'm like, no, it's the same person. Well, it's funny, you know, and I felt that too. In, the, in my career at different points, I was a different person in work, especially when I was a new advisor. I felt like I had to be this, you know, stoic person that was this super professional person. And the more you're yourself, the better you do, the more happy you are too. And the more yeah. perfect you are. Yeah. And that's been, you know, John, what's wild is like, I've had so many clients who've approached us that used to be people that we would be like chasing and it's so funny because like once you stop chasing and you kind of like, again, it sounds fluffy, but like tell the universe, here's what I want. Yeah. And you just actually start focusing on like building your team and infrastructure to service those folks. Those folks somehow find the radio and they literally are just calling. And it's, it's amazing. Like I've had some substantial clients reach out through like Facebook who are just like friends and like neighbors and they're, like, you know, you just seem really approachable. You seem really funny. And obviously you're successful. So can we talk? And I'm like, sure. <laughs> that's a great point to be at, you know, that's, that takes a little bit, but, uh, so what is your vision? Where are you taking this? Um, God, I don't even know. I like, literally, I look at it like in 90 day intervals. Like I don't have a place I'm trying to get to, but I imagine that at some point, like I just opened an office in the Cape not a Ameriprise office, but like I bought a space that literally was in reaction to COVID. But my whole mantra again with our clients and personally is being prepared for anything, not just bad things, but good opportunities that come up. And we have a house on the Cape that's like our dream house, like vacation home. So when the COVID thing struck, we were like, let's go to the happy place. And we've been there basically since March. And we quickly learned like, oh my God, we can't work out of the house with kids. And we have a substantial amount of responsibility and promises that we've made to our clients and our team and, and our family. And I'm not good when I don't separate work from my home life. Like I'm not good for anybody. So we ended up finding a space, which again, it's just, I'm laughing. I don't know how we found something for so cheap. It like doesn't exist. It's like, again, I, I believe you set it out to the universe and the universe will respond, but you have to say what you want. So I don't say what I want in 10 years. I kind of just, gravitate. So I would imagine in 10 years, and it's not a goal, it's just imagining what may be, is we'll have multiple offices in multiple states that will have men, women, all different backgrounds, old, young, but the culture's the same. Mm -hmm. um, so that's also where I think defining your culture is so insanely important. Like even I talked to my team about, you know, not just the culture, but even like your processes. Like there's a new team member that joined and she's like, well, I do it this way. Maybe I'll do some of the things you do. And I'm like, mm -mm. we have to all agree of how we're going to do it. Cause that's the only way we guarantee the experience that the client will have and that each other and supporting each other is going to have is going to be consistent. But the backbone of it all is the culture mm -hmm. is everything. All the other stuff doesn't matter if you can't define your culture. So how important, so culture obviously is critical. You talked about process. So are you a big process person? Does that need to be, I mean, is that a critical part for running a successful business? So the Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawande is like my Bible. So mm -hmm. yes, <laughs> this process is for, that is one of the best John books I've ever read. I read it at jury duty one day, just randomly, it was in my bag. And then I like share it with like clients, friends, business owners. It's one of the most, basically it's just like there needs, there every behind every successful business, production, even like, you know, rock stars and, and real estate and restaurants, everyone has a process, whether it's a written like recipe, like that you cannot pass go until you've done this step, this step, or it's like just an open list that you refer back to your list to make sure you didn't miss something. Mm -hmm. We are now continuing to put to paper processes for everything. Mm -hmm. And 
the cool thing about that is then you can scale it. You can't scale it if it's not written. So that's what I quickly learned um, when it went from me and just my one of my team members that we were relatively new to each other when we went from the employee advisor side to the franchise side. So that was a total shit storm. <laughs> like we're going into this white space, 2,400 square feet. There's no nothing like we are tech. We are HR. We are the advisor. We are everything. Um, what's that? It's overwhelming, right? It was, it was insane. But the truth is I like, I do my best in total clusters of situations. Like when things get, I end up making mistakes when I get bored. So I really like to be not bored, <laughs> but many of my team don't like that space. So it's important for me to also be mindful and understand like their tolerance and what are the things to give them and what are the things to shield them from. So I don't share everything with them, not because it's a secret, but I don't want to set them up to fail. Mm -hmm. um, so again, just like being more self-aware of yourself and then for, mm -hmm. and, and then you can share that with others, you can do better. But uh, I mean, our growth, the more we got systems down and written, and again, we're continuing to look to be more efficient with how do I find five minutes? How do I shave off? Like, how do I decrease my likelihood of mistakes? That's actually a big thing in the checklist manifesto. The first example they give is about how until hospitals around globally had a written checklist of like, before you're going to like put a needle in someone to like wash your hands, make sure the things still are sterilized and then do a couple other things. But infection rate went from like 70% to under 1%. Like crazy shit. And it's just like, it's like so simple. Um, so sometimes, literally sometimes, if someone gives me pushback on it, I go, don't fight me. Read the freaking book. And just, you know, th this here. And the book's like a 45 minute, like couple glasses of wine. Like it's an awesome read. It's not about financial planning. Yeah. It's literally like how to simplify your life. And my other... My other thing is the four hour work week by Tim Ferriss. Like you put those right together right there. Yeah. Yeah. That's my, that's my, those are like my babies of like, that's my brain. Um, yeah. And it's amazing with processes is so many leaders that either they don't have processes for their life or for their business or their processes suck. They're broken. You know, they don't work or the, the client experience if they're client facing businesses is uh, it works for them, but it, totally doesn't for the clients, you know, and they wonder why they don't have more clients. Yep. Yeah. Makes sense. And that's where like, there's no ego. That's the other thing on my team. I have, there's no ego to me. There's no ego. And I tell my team members there cannot work with people that have big egos. Like in terms of if something's broken or we think there's a better way, let's like, let's embrace that better way. <laughs> let's not be like so stubborn that we can't change and let's like also be open to trying things that may not work i don't see it as a failure as long as it's a calculated effort and if it didn't work let's make sure we learn from it mm -hmm. so that's where too i i help my client my my clients i help my team understand like when you make a mistake you gotta understand like you literally gotta put yourself in that other person's shoes and go if someone else i gave something to screwed up do I actually care that they screwed up? Because usually the answer is no. They just care, did you fix it? And did you make it a headache for me? Or did you just let me know I screwed it up, but I already fixed it. Here's what I did. And you're just, but the last step is you communicated that it did happen. Like you want to do that unless it really is relevant. And again, just being very open and honest is the only, not the best policy. It's the only one. Yeah. And that's where with our clients, with our team members, because I know that, even though I think I'm very approachable, I scare the crap out of people when they come to work for me. <laughs> Cause I'm just a lot. And like, God, I'm very self-aware. I know that. Yeah. But I try to make sure from the beginning that they understand I don't have an expectation of perfect. Like I'm not trying to be perfect. I'm not trying to be better than anyone else or myself. I'm just trying to grow and transform and create cool shit together. And it's way more fun doing it as a team. Yeah. And you come up with way better stuff when you don't try to do it yourself. So you get a lot of your ideas and things like that from your team. So you're kind of, you're asking them for their, so I mm -hmm. think a, lot, a big part of that too, is you've got to create an organization where people feel like, okay, it's okay to give ideas or feedback. Does your team tell you if they think something's messed up and Hey, we're going in the wrong direction or that's not, that's a bad idea. So they're pretty, yep. about that. and even, yeah. And even better, it's now like go pilot something yourself. Don't ask me for permission. Go do that thought process to paper, convince yourself that that's something worth, putting time into 
because my team has open permission for me to spend money to do whatever as long as the end result is it brings value so they but, actually have so they can spend money i mean they're making decisions they don't have to I, go to you for everything i don't want them to go to me that's exhausting to me i'm like oh not talk about not my unique ability but yeah. granted there'll be some times that the, they understand they're not going to be like the culture is not such that they would ever be punished for taking a risk that didn't pan out right what's important to me is that they go oh i did this it didn't work out here's what i learned from it that's all i care yeah. is that you're paying attention yeah any examples of things that you tried or risks you took that didn't pay, pay off <sighs> or mistakes Give me like 30 seconds and sure I can think of something. <laughs> <laughs> I should have thought of this in advance. Um, sure. I mean, sometimes it's just like, it's, sometimes it's not even money. It's like time of things that, um, so even as silly as like in this period, like we had the mail set up to be forwarded to someone's house once it was approved. And the mail system, like, I don't know why, but every other day, the postman, I'm still like delivering stuff at the office. So we weren't getting stuff. And we have spent, and one of my team members shared like, oh my God, do you know how many hours I've spent on the line with the post office? And I was like, seriously, why the hell are you spending all this time in the post office? Like you can't control or influence the flipping post office. Just go to the frigging office and pick up the mail then. <laughs> and I think it's more of just going, hey, I'm not mad at you for doing that. But what I need to understand is that you're self-aware to go, well, it's kind of stupid to keep doing something that's not working. So let's at least do what is going to work and let's move forward. Or, um, but money things, there really haven't been any. I got to tell you, John, because my team is really sensitive to, I'm the one that makes the biggest money decisions. My team is like, they're too, uh, uh, spend thrift in a good way. Yeah. Um, cause I spend like an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, I'm like, you know, let's blow out the kitchen and build a kitchen. And they're like, I don't think we need to. I'm like, yeah, but I want to. So we're going to do it. And they're like, okay. <laughs> but I like, I'm doing that because I want to. So they then like, just make like good decisions with everything else. It's now more of no kidding. It was, Oh, days before everything shut down, like permanently in Massachusetts that the kitchen project was finished. And we had like unboxed everything. And again, talk about like the universe taking care of us because days, I would have been coming back to like construction in my office. Like I can't imagine, but everyone got it done. And it was like, I, like I actually was supposed to be in LA to visit my brother and do, um, it was actually a strategic coach event I was going to go to. And the COVID thing was happening, but it was before it was like really a thing. And I just had this pit in my stomach and I always trust my gut. That was like, I don't think you should go. And I was more nervous that I would get stuck there. Now, I would be totally cool being stuck in LA with my brother, like living the dream and my husband stuck with the kids, but he might kill me <laughs> if I did that. So I said, I stay home. And so I had these quote unquote found days and I just always try to be productive in my found days, especially because we had a lot going on. And thank God we did. And we, the group of us, again, many hands made like work. We emptied everything, cleaned everything, but it took two straight days of doing it. And I'm just like, holy crap. Like if we hadn't done that, then we would have come back to this mess. Oh, and now yeah. we get to come back and enjoy this beautiful space. Yeah. Um, well, it sounds like you have, and they, the difference is they're not employees. They're, no. they're, they're owners. They're almost act as they've got, they've got ownership in the place. Yeah. And I, you know what too, John, I found very early on when one of my team members, one of the first to join like my like real practice here, I like, it didn't feel like it was a business a practice until I was on, not because it was the independent side, but that was the shift for me in my mindset of what I was doing, um, that I was building something. Um, and this is fun and it's not just about making money anymore. Not like it was before, but it, you know, in the beginning when you're making nothing, like it does matter about making money and it's like, oh my God, I can't make any personal life decisions until it's consistent and how am I going to hire someone? But that's where like, I've made a lot of chicken or egg decisions and I've always, always, always bet on people and invested in people before the income was even there. Um, and I have a really amazing supportive husband who also supports those decisions. Um, but I found that it was really important not to just hire anyone, but again, to find the culture that this person's coming into, what's expected of them, not even in terms of their role, but like what's being a true team player. So again, I'm Tom Brady. Think of it that way. I'm Tom Brady. I'm on the field with you. So like if I say something you don't like, I make a call you don't like, 
Tom Brady's not going to be psyched if his team members like rolling his eyes at him. Like, mm-hmm. how confident am I when I like take the ball back? I don't even play for freaking football. That's from what I understand. So I'm like, team, listen, like on, like if we're in front of clients or our backstage, I'm Tom Brady, I'm making the play. Like this isn't practice. So practice is our monthly meetings. Practice is our quarterly offsites. That let's throw a bunch of shit on the wall and tell me what you unapologetically think. And sometimes in the end, I may go, I totally disagree. But most of the time I'm like, it's these little tweaks that make it work way better for them and there's no impact for me. But why the heck wouldn't I want my team to be happy? Yeah, awesome. Awesome stuff. Wow. I, I know we're at the end of our time here and I'd love to, uh, to keep going here um, because there's still so much I want to talk to you about. But what, what would you leave the people listening? We've talked about so much stuff, leadership, uh, you know, in, in every aspect, culture, um, the journey. What would you leave everybody with? Any kind of final advice or thoughts? I think the biggest thing is trust your gut. Don't feel like you have to apologize to anybody about what you're excited about, what your dreams are, um, and what you're looking to build. And continue to intentionally surround yourself with the right people that excite you and inspire you. And kindly get rid of the people that don't. <laughs> yeah, got to get the wrong people out. Got to got to guardian keep your uh, garden of life. Uh, pull the weeds out sometimes. Yep. Yeah, good stuff. So if people want to get a hold of you, they want to talk to you or maybe work with you, how do they get a hold of you? Um, you're welcome to anyone. Welcome to email me, collaborate. Even better than a question is a collaboration. I'm a, my favorite thing in the whole world to do is brainstorm, um, usually with a glass of wine in hand. So like, let's strategically plan what time we're going to collaborate. Um, and email me, carolyn.l.nolan at ampf.com. If you Google me, Carolyn Nolan the gorgeous boss babe team. You'll find us on there. So just Google us. You'll find us. Awesome. We'll put that, we'll put all that in the notes of the show. Uh, This has been great. I'm so grateful to have you on. I really appreciate it. And hopefully next we'll have you down uh, maybe a little bit down the road for part two. I'd love to. Good. All right, everybody. This has been Carolyn Nolan joining us on Tomorrow's Leader uh, for some fantastic conversation. Appreciate all you watching. Appreciate your likes, your shares, your comments, and uh, keep the ideas coming for guests, for topics that you want to hear about, and uh, continue to lead on. Thanks, everybody. And Carolyn, thanks again. Thanks, John. All right.